Welcome to the Fall Play YouTube channel. Hey, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Foul Play, our, our weekly podcast. Uh, and our podcast today is entitled Trial Tunnel Vision Number 3. And my name is Dr. Silkman. Um, now, just to let everyone know before we start the podcast, we have reached 749 subscribers. And that is absolutely awesome, guys. And we thank each and every one of you. Uh, if you enjoy what we do, please hit the like and please hit the subscribe button. And we appreciate all the comments that you give us. Uh, we read them and we try to answer them as quickly as we possibly can. And our foul play uh, videos on YouTube have had over 155,000 views. And that's awesome, considering that really, as a group, we're quite young. I think we started in about August last year. So we appreciate uh, all your feedback um, that you've given us. And we're here to improve. And we're here to hopefully um, educate people about uh, both the Brendan Dassey and the Stephen Avery cases. What we do on the podcast is that we follow the MAM1 series and we open up uh, a series of questions and answers to our panel. And today, guys, our regular researchers joining me are BB, Big Jeff, Kelly, Christy, Milbilly, and Obi Wan. On our chat, monitoring the YouTube channel, we have both Sammy and Zoe. So guys, please write down your questions. Uh, both Sammy, uh, Sammy or Zoe will uh, let us know uh, about questions and we'll try and answer them on air. And guys, I'm delighted today. Um, we have uh, two new guest researchers, both Kate and Maz. So we welcome guys, welcome our guest researchers to the podcast. And we welcome all our listeners, our regular listeners to the show. Before we actually start, what I'd like to do is to just quickly ask our guest researchers. I'll ask Maz first. Maz, uh, what, in, what interested you in the cases? Give us a little bit of a background about yourself. Hi. Thank I'm you, Maz. Hi, I'm Maz and I'm in the UK. Um, it was my son, first of all, who said, have you watched this series on Netflix, Mother? And I said, <laughs> oh, sounds interesting. And he saw it's right up your street. So that was it. I binge watched both series, series one and two, yes. over all the end, and got hooked from there, going down rabbit holes and reading files and court documents. And yeah, that was it, basically. Oh, fantastic. Got fantastic. Uh, so you're hooked like the rest of us? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank God none of us are obsessed in this case, of course. Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Maz. We appreciate that. Uh, and our second guest researcher is Kate. Uh, Kate, if I could just quickly ask, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what interested you in the cases. Kate. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Kate from the UK as well, from Wales. Oh, and both from the UK. Yeah. I uh, watched Mam a little bit late. It was about six months before the second one came out, so I was a bit late okay. to the game anyway, but I got obsessed straight away. Wanted to know, really, looking online, if there was, you know, there's a lot of believers who believe, you know, guilters who believe that he's guilty. Yes. And uh, Brendan's yes. guilt, and I wanted to really see if there was any actual evidence, and um, like, yes, if the show was biased in any way, if we were missing out on something because they seemed to say we were, but yes, so far I still haven't found anything, any evidence to show that he is. Yes, um, and the more we've looked into it, and the chat rooms, and on the YouTube videos, the more yes, I've sort of been convinced that he was completely framed. You know, yes, of. Oh. Unbelievable. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, and thank you, guest yes. researchers. We oh, thank you. 
uh, we appreciate that very much. And uh, what we'll do, we'll make a start on the podcast proper. And um, today's a little bit special. Um, um, as you'll see that uh, most of us on the panel, we are very interested in the Steve Avery case, of course, but we have a special, I think um, I'm not out of line here, we have a special, a very special interest in Brendan Dassey. Um, and the reason for that, it's a multitude of reasons, but this is a classic case of where someone has been placed uh, in life in prison uh, in prison for a very long time before uh, Brendan is uh, due for parole, and this is solely based on confession. There was no forensic evidence at all uh, linking Brendan uh, to anything that occurred in the trailer, the garage, even the Toyota RAV4. It is solely based on confession. Uh, and this is very, very serious because it goes to show that if you don't have a proper legal representation, if you don't have an adult uh, with you or an attorney, you can end up in a lot, a lot of trouble. Um, and so I have a special interest in, especially with Brendan's case, um, I've done a series of um, presentations regarding Brendan. Uh, and it's just been mind-blowing um, what happened, the shenanigans that happened. Uh, and today, just as a little a bit of an extra, I'm going to be reading a few quotes from um, our favourite um, Ken Kratz, who wrote a book, and uh, Christy will pack me up. It was a pretty heavy reading uh, going through his book, and uh, both Christy and I have now read it several times. And I think it's important uh, for our listeners to uh, really get inside the mind of the special uh, prosecuting attorney, uh, his thoughts of um, how the uh, cases went down. So, um, Christy, do you have any quick comments um, about our favourite Ken Kratz? Uh, nothing that we haven't already said before. Very yes. narcissistic, very jealous of Stephen pages in that book were just dripping with jealousy and hate for a man that he didn't even know. Um, a man yeah. that had never done anything to him personally. Just, yes. yeah, I definitely recommend people read the book for themselves. Um, yeah. Don't buy it. Find a free way to read it. If you don't know how to read it for free, contact me and I'll tell you. Um, definitely yes. do not give that man a dollar. Um, yes. but I, I definitely recommend reading it. It gives you a whole different view of Ken Kratz, in my opinion. Yes, it does. Not a better Thank one. You. Definitely not a better one. <laughs> no. An even worse one. Definitely. I just want to clear that up. It doesn't make you think no. highly of him at all. It yes. will solidify everything you think of him For and sure. maybe even now, make it a little worse. Yes. Uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Thank you, Christy. Uh, I, Big Jeff. I, I do. Uh, uh, we just got done with a couple of podcasts in a row. Uh, sorry, Your volume is a bit low, low, Big Jeff. Yes, can't hear you. Uh, Okay, Big Jeff is just going in and out. Uh, Big Jeff, are you back? Yeah, I, I am. Yeah, That's we, better. Uh, we just uh, had got done with a couple of uh, consecutive podcasts uh, involving the calls that focus heavily on uh, uh, our theories, uh, Christie's theories in particular, about the state's motive to coerce Brandon. Uh, please take yes. a listen to those. Yes. Um, on our foul, our foul Play channel, we have... Um, a multitude of podcasts um, uh, headlined by Big Jeff and Christy and other researchers. Please go check them out. There's some incredible uh, information there, especially regarding the uh, phone calls. And Christy, of course, has done a superb analysis on the phone calls and she's done a huge amount of work. And now it's all coming together quite nicely with the podcast. And also, we invite you to come and have a look at Mill Billy's uh, excellent YouTube channel. He's done superb amount of work on the phone calls regarding uh, law enforcement, um, and it's all coming really well together. Uh, and it accumulates with the podcasts that we do on a weekly basis. And we now are in a very strong position 
where we can bring in the phone calls and quotes from Ken Kratz's book. Um, and it's coming together quite nicely. All right, guys. Um, if we have a look, we finished that slide 176. Now, remember, um, Brendan Dassey was uh, interrogated, I think, a total of about six times, um, mainly by Fassbender and Wiegert. Um, and Stephen and uh, Ken Kratz was, um, he was, um, what can I say? He wanted to get Brendan Dassey on tape, on videotape. Um, he wanted his confession to be recorded, of course. And we have the very fateful um, interrogation that was done on the 1st of March. Now, guys, we all know that on the 2nd of March, Ken Kratz did the uh, press conference, that massively damaging press conference. Um, where basically he outlined what happened, what allegedly happened to Teresa. Uh, and it really would have shocked um, uh, people around Wisconsin. Now, Milbilly, is it true that you actually heard that live when that press conference went to air? Milbilly. Yeah, I watched it, watched it live. That's for sure. What what was, were you in, what were your impressions? Well, I was actually I can remember I was at home. Yes. With my daughter that was just born, she was uh, three months old. Yes. And it just popped on the TV, breaking news, live press conference, and yeah, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, uh, did that um, taint your impressions of both uh, Brendan and Stephen at that early stage? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it pretty much. I always had doubts in the beginning, but after that, it was like, okay, he had to have done it now. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's that's truly remarkable when you think about it. Um, and you know, there was no no trial, nothing, and you have a a, a, a prosecutor coming out on national television. Um, stating um, all the things that allegedly took place to uh, Teresa Horbach, uh, both by Brendan Dassey uh, and Stephen Avery. And I just want to quote this from um, uh, Ken Kratz's book. I quote, I have one major regret in my prosecution of the Horbach case, and that is the press conference I gave on March the 2nd revealing some of the graphic details contained in Dassey's criminal complaint. Making a murderer seems to imply I loved and often courted the media, which wasn't the case at all. Now, guys, is there any feedback on that comment, Christy? I couldn't get my finger to the mute button fast enough. Lies, <laughs> lies, lies. He doesn't yeah. need... He... His only regret. If that is the only He's thing only, he regrets. Yes. His, oh, come. Oh, another podcast, another day. You and I will discuss this. People can come listen to this conversation another time. We won't take over the podcast with this subject. Over but yeah, and over again. Lies. Right? Lies. lies. No, All of it correct. lies. Correct. Correct. Big Jeff, do you have a quick comment? Yeah, he's so full of shit, it's coming out of his ears. Oh no! He, re uh, he yes. really is. I listen to listen yeah. to Thursday. Um, he 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 needed. They needed Brendan. They needed him right now. His property bond was coming due. He was gonna get. He was gonna get out of prison, uh, out of out of jail on the property bond. They needed. Yes. They needed Brendan to get Stephen. Uh, and they needed that graphic press 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 conference to make yes. the impression on the media on the judge. So Stephen would stay right where he belonged according to their needs. In yes. Jail. Yes. Full but of shit. Yes, uh, and look, I like to warn our, our listeners, there's going to be a lot of uh, foul language on our uh, podcast, um, not coming from us, I don't think, but uh, some of the quotes from Ken Kratz's book. And it's important really to understand um, the thinking of the prosecutor and also Fassbender and Wiegert. Uh, the podcast, we go over the slides from Man One, but it's really all the behind the scenes um, actions which are so important 
And that's why the podcast, the TTTs, uh, are, are so important. And also the analysis of the phone calls uh, are very important as well. And before we continue 176, I'd like to finish uh, with another quote from uh, Ken Kratz's book. Now, remember, he talked about his one regret. He follows this up, and this is relevant to our podcast. He goes, but I lose no sleep over my prosecution of Brendan Dassey. I was a prosecutor with a dead young woman and her surviving family for which to pursue justice. <laughs> so on the one hand, he has a great regret, but on the other, on the flip side, he had a job to do. Christy. Jeff, I'm going to need you to help me here. Yeah, oh no. um, <laughs> <laughs> I believe that I'm going to um, go to the... <laughs> wow. Does he not portray himself as the only one that was looking out for Brendan Dassey in his sacrificial lamb video? Oh, God. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Thank you. And by the way, thank you, N64 Controller, for preserving those videos. Thank yes. you very much. You, we cert yes, we certainly do, because uh, Ken Kratz has taken down uh, his videos, <laughs> in which uh, I've spent a lot of time and other, other researchers spent a lot of time writing down comments, of course, none of which Ken Kratz ever replied to. Um, and it's important because if we look at slide 176, it's important to get into um, Ken Kratz's mind and how he behaved uh, in court and the way he approached uh, the trial. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? The lies. How, how could he not regret the lies? Where were the pools of blood in the round? <laughs> yes. Where, where yes. were they? The, so, yes. so not, you know, he, I, I, I regret doing it. What, yes. what about the friggin' lies? Correct. I mean, it's um, the damage was done. Um, you can't um, you can't unsee that. Uh, a huge amount of damage was done. I can't believe that the trial wasn't actually thrown out uh, from the start because the jury pool would have been heavily tainted. Bibi, do you have a comment? Yes. Well, now correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't they now using this in law school throughout correct. the land? To teach what correct. not to do. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, and this is the irony, of course. We have a, a Milbilly. Do you have a comment? Well, as to the jury being tainted, Jerry Bruni does an interview and he talks about how uh, jurors were making comments like, oh, we could just look up stuff on our computers and then delete it. And then they yes. won't know we did it. Correct. One of the jurors says, well, they can still find it. And then Jerry Budin states that the juror's face went like white as a ghost. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, as we know, guys, uh, the, the judge uh, gives a speech to all the jurors uh, and they're not meant to interact with the outside world. They're not going to discuss certain things. Uh, and clearly that was happening, right? And we also know the, the case of the juror who was excused from the trial because uh, his daughter apparently was, or a family member was in a terrible, horrible crash and he had to leave. Um, and, you know, he, he was, he, he, they later interviewed him and he gave feedback about what was happening. And then you've got your classic um, Remica, I think it was Remica bringing in pizza or allowing people to bring in pizza who shouldn't have been there. And yeah, it was a bit of a disaster. Mill Billy, do you have a comment? Yeah, he let the delivery driver in and the delivery driver end up staying. And the delivery driver wasn't really a delivery driver. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, and... More than food. Correct. Correct. The whole thing, the whole thing was a real farce. And echoing what BB said, it's remarkable um, that there are elements of this case which are used in uh, professional uh, law schools on exactly how not to do an interrogation or or a whole series of questioning, and um, especially to young people. And you, the tragedy is, you'll see, uh, in particular, this podcast that it really was a statements made by two young kids 
both Brendan and his cousin Kayla, which landed Brendan into a lot of trouble. But I'd just like to make a comment before we continue with 176, slide 176. And this is the way um, Ken Kratz thought about um, Brendan Dassey. Uh, and this is very important because he had his own personal viewpoint. And a quote from his book, Making a murder of viewers can't forget Brendan Dassey or help but feel sorry for him. And I quote, He's the shuffling, mumbling young man with bad skin and broken bowl haircut, a cipher adrift with tiny promise of a future. Now, when, when you've got the prosecutor making statements like that, um, you know it's a real disaster. Uh, does anyone have any comments about that? So clearly... Uh, Clearly, the prosecutor didn't have much hope for poor Brendan, Bibi. Yeah, that's horribly insulting yeah. of him to sit there and talk about him like that. Yes, 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 it was. Uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? I do, uh, but that is that uh, Brendan has a better chance of trying a case in court than Kratz does at this point. <laughs> yes, it does. But um, He might it's not amazing. have a law license, but he can get one, right? Yes. Yes, but it's amazing. Um, it's amazing, though. Um, I never wanted to read Ken Kratz's book, but and Christy will agree, I think, that it gives you a behind the scenes insight into the inner, inner workings of someone who is totally obsessed with Stephen Avery and the notoriety that he achieved. Uh, and from a narcissistic viewpoint, how he approached this particular case. And as we can see on slide 176, they basically took apart um, Brendan's statements. Uh, this is on the interrogation session done on March the 1st. And the way uh, Ken Kratz approached it, he asked two basic questions. And he was asking the jury, was he there? This is referring to Brendan. Was he there? Did he help? And on both cases, on both questions, he said, absolutely. Right? And then he was trying to bring in the forensic evidence that will prove that the statements made by Brendan uh, were indeed true. And as you can see on slide 176, we have um, statements. And for example, he says, Dassey sees Teresa Horbach restrained in Stephen Avery's bedroom, handcuffed naked to bed, which is very, very interesting because initially Brendan Dassey didn't say that Teresa Horbach was allegedly handcuffed to a bed. Does anyone actually remember what he said? Who could remember what he actually said? Not he handcuffed to a shackled, bed, but shackled, no Billy? Shackled, shackled, yeah. shackled to a bed. Yes, yes. Chained, what else? chained right? Chained, chained to a bed. But he said something else which didn't even mention bed. Does anyone remember what it was? In, in fact, Kayla repeated it. Can anyone remember? <laughs> All right. It was actually um, a BB. Toes in the fire? He mentions toes in the fire, which we'll discuss. No, he said that uh, when he entered Stephen Avery's bedroom, she was pinned to a chair. Pinned to a chair. And Kayla repeats that. And suddenly, Bibi. I must comment. have missed that part. Yeah, I must have missed yeah. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's actually pinned to a chair. And it's sort of like, how did it drift? from a chair to the bed. And we'll actually go through that. We'll go through the testimony and we actually know why. But to, to make it even more damaging, I don't know if, you, if the listeners can remember uh, and whether the panel can remember, but Ken Kratz's voice completely changed when he was talking about what 
Brendan allegedly did to Teresa. Uh, his voice became very low, um, falsetto-like, um, and you could almost see the tears coming down his eyes. He really turned on the emotions, and uh, he was very definitive. Ken Kratz was very definitive when he said, was he there? Did he help? Absolutely. To drive that point home. And to make matters worse, you can see uh, on the right-hand side, well, his uncle praised Brendan and even allegedly said to him, that's how you do it. So in court, that would have been devastating to hear uh, that type of comment coming from Brendan's mouth, allegedly coming from Brendan himself. Guys, do we have any comments about the demeanor of Ken Kratz? Any comments? There's a whole lot of comments in here in the uh, Sammy. chat about him. Sammy. Yeah, there's just a lot of conversation about him and his grossness and, yeah. you know, how absurd he is. Yeah, yeah. And I think once, thank, thank you, Sammy. I think once you uh, understand his character, his nature, his behavior, remember, we've got to understand how did he prosecute? How did the prosecuting team win the case when there was no forensic evidence at all? And this is very important because potentially it can affect all of us, including uh, ourselves and our loved ones, if someone makes an accusation that you have committed this horrendous crime. Sammy. Well, um, Kenneth Christensen is asking, according to Brendan, he spoke with Blaine's boss the 31st of October. Yes. Did the defense check the phone records? I think they did. Yeah, it, it was real. It was real. Uh, and we'll go into that because they've got, a, they've got a printout of all the phone conversations that took place uh, in the Dassey household. So they've got a record. Um, Mill Billy. Well... Law enforcement was feeding everything to the media. So it was one-sided from the beginning. Yes. That's why Stephen fought so hard to try to get his voice out there. Because he believed nobody was listening to him. Especially his first investigators that were working yes. for the state. Everything they were finding, they were going right back and telling the defense. Yes. Yeah, that's very important. Um, thank you, Mill Billy. Chrissy, do you have a comment? It, it does seem like every time something came out in the media that was just bullshit, Stephen picked up the phone yes. and called whatever media outlet next and just talked and talked and talked because he what he didn't feel like his side was yeah his side wasn't getting out. The media was all one sided. Yes, um, well, the amazing thing is this: Ken Kratz and Christy, you backed me up on this, Ken Kratz. Uh, the reason why he did the March 2nd press conference was that he believed that everything was skewed towards Stephen Avery's point of view and not the state's point of view. Uh, because one thing, Christy, do you have a comment? I, be, lining the calls up with the book and everything else we know, they were listening to Stephen's phone calls. There were still before yes. that press conference, there was yes. so many people that still believed in Stephen. I have to go back and listen to a few things. I haven't been able to bring myself to do it yet. But I want to say that at some point in time, there's a phone call where Dolores tells Stephen that there's a sheriff or an officer or somebody. And every time she sees him, he always tells her he believes Stephen's innocent. He hopes that, you know, this all works out for yes. Stephen. The next time she sees that man, he's on the news and it's right after Kratz's press conference and he's saying that Stephen's guilty and he should fry, basically. Yes. So yes. I believe that Ken Kratz is listening, whether it's people that he's seeing out in public, too many people thought this was a setup. Too many people thought it was a cover up. Once Brendan, once the press conference happened, everybody was, oh shit, this must have happened. Just like Millbilly yes. said. Just like yes. Millbilly said, he thought it was yeah. a setup until he saw that yes. press conference and then his yeah. opinion changed. And that's yes. when that's when that's when yeah. the public shifted into the state's favor and not Stephen's favor. I really think a lot of the public thought this was a frame 
before yeah. that March 2nd press conference. Yes. Uh, Kate, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think most people, at least back then, wouldn't have believed that a coerced confession could happen. So as soon as no. the confession happened, they're like, yeah, obviously. You know, until watching all of this and then about Brendan, I didn't realise how many people could confess and it be coerced. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thank you, Kate. Um, Maz, do you have a comment? Yeah, I totally agree with Kate. Like I say, coerced confessions, it's not a thing we hear of in the UK. And it's not until you watch Ma'am and then you watch Brendan on the screen that you think, my God, it really does happen. And, you know, your heart just goes yeah. out to Definitely. Correct. I mean, uh, I was actually, thank you, Maz. I was actually quite shocked at the actual percentage of people who are in prison um, based on false confessions. Uh, it's a lot. It is significant. Uh, and keep in mind that... Um, uh, Brendan was a young boy. He was 16 at the time. Sammy, do you have a comment? Um, yes. Bailey Morgan said Ken was only doing his job. It's the dirty cops that need to be looked at. I just would like to say he went above and beyond what his job was. He made sure that everyone anywhere that could hear or see any of these reports in the papers, the media, thought of these two as monsters yeah but ken kratz is i Thank know what he's gonna do when this comes to trial and everything gets put out all he's gonna say is i was just following the evidence the law enforcement was giving me oh yeah 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 um i, I agree with you mill billy ken kratz uh he's like teflon he's untouchable uh, he he's got he's got to get out clause. Don't worry about that. Uh, Big Jeff, do you have do you have a comment? I do. Uh, my comment is as follows. I'd like to address this person directly. What was his name again, Sammy? This was a Bailey. Bailey, Bailey. If your father, your brother, your son, self, if you potentially stand there with, with the um, possibility of being wrongfully accused. Would you like a prosecutor who would mutually search for the defense for exculpatory evidence or who's going to treat this like a game to win? And he's going to yeah. g give himself yes. kudos for, yeah. for winning this, irrespective yes. of whether the person is guilty or not. And, yes. and one more thing, he Kratz should be prosecuted for prosecutorial misconduct for that press conference. Right. He was not just yes. doing his job. Like Sammy said, he went above and beyond. He crossed into territory that could that could have gotten uh, him charges brought against him. Yeah, but Pagel is sitting right next to him when this is all going down. Yes, correct. Correct. I think uh, if you have a look at that press conference, I think Pagel actually looked uncomfortable <laughs> as uh, as uh, Ken Kratz was um basically spewing out the scenario. Uh, Kate, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, and um, Kratz still is doing it. He's still doing, you know, prosecuting against him or saying stuff against him all over the internet for everyone to see all the time. Uh, correct, correct. Obi-Wan, do you have, thank you, Kate. Obi-Wan, do you have a comment? Yeah, <clears throat> i got to address this too, because he's... <sighs> If just if if someone's saying that he's doing his job, the job that he's doing is what uh, the state is wanting him to do. He's not doing his job and his role under the color of law. He's doing evil, malicious things, things that yeah. wouldn't this this wouldn't go unpunished anywhere else. And yeah, uh, people would definitely raise big questions about this huge questions and yeah. uh i mean there's yeah i agree i agree there's certain things like what he did uh prior to the trial he ruined any chance of avery to have a fair trial you know what i mean coming out with all that correct yeah stuff yeah basically he got on the front foot he got on the front foot first uh and if i could just say obi-wan and Christy will back me up on this. It is absolutely crystal clear in Ken Kratz's book. He even states he listened to all the phone calls. 
every one of them. And he had researchers listening to the phone calls as well. So he right. would have been well aware. He would have been well aware early on what Stephen Avery was saying, uh, both to his family and to the media, that he was being set up. So Ken Kratz got on the front foot first by calling in that devastating press conference. Uh, Christian, Mark, do you have a quick comment? Thank you, Obi Wan. I, I just want to say, in, in reference to Ken Kratz was just doing his job, I just want to know what other prosecutor has acted like that. Yeah. What other? He went above and beyond his job. He, that, yes. he, he went above and beyond his job. He did more than his job. His job as a prosecutor is to put away guilty people for crimes. And he, yes. no, he went above and beyond to solidify a conviction that should have never even made it past indictment. Well, on November 9th, right after Stephen Avery's arrested, the night, Jerry Pagel calls looking for Peg Lagenslider's number so he can call her. Well, the yes. person on the phone says, oh, I think Ken has it already. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean... It's pretty obvious that there was a plan, a plan in place. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Uh, oh, I do. Um, does uh, after all this business with Len Kaczynski, uh, does does Kratz say, you know what, what happened to Brendan was wrong, and Brendan should be able to change attorneys from Len Kaczynski, or did Ken Kratz fight the changing of Len Kaczynski? Oh well, look. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, we that... know we know the answer, right? Is that so? Is, <laughs> is that so, is that someone who's just doing his job? Uh, right? Yeah. Sure. Or is that someone um, well, who's looking out for the people who he's supposed to be looking for? Yes. Um, Big Jeff, um, uh, Ken Kratz actually goes into this in his book, and we'll actually discuss it in the podcast. Um, there was a plan in place. Uh, it's pretty obvious that both the state and the defense were sharing cappuccinos together, and they had a plan in place which unfortunately went awry, as we'll see in a minute. Obi-Wan, do you have a comment? Yeah, he was also trying to get people to lie, uh, uh, you know what I mean, lie under oath. Uh, uh, yes. Until he was caught, you know. I, I don't yes. see how he, this could be considered him doing his job, you know what I mean? What, ha what happens hadn't Buting called him out on it and, and went into the judge's chambers, he would have. Uh, went through with it and had Brent or uh, Bobby Dassey lie about that information and in, uh, the oh, discussion. Yeah. What happened Correct. or what uh, Stephen had said, you know? Correct. Correct. Uh, yeah. The whole thing regarding Mike Osmondson and the comments about um, burying a body and things like that. Uh, yeah. Um, look, that wasn't the only thing. There were many incidences um, in which Ken Kratz. Um, let's put it this way, stretched uh, the truth um, <laughs> to breaking point. Um, so we can see the scenario here. Uh, that March the 1st um, interrogation was very, very devastating. Um, uh, Milbilly, do you have a comment? Well, like I said, after I seen the press conference with Brendan, I, I assumed that they were guilty. But after looking into the case, I've always thought that Brendan either overheard something or seen something. Yeah. But after yeah. listening to all these jail calls, yes. he was fed everything. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Mubili. And Christy has done an awesome job because um, I'm in the process of listening to the calls myself, which involve Brendan Dassey. And there's about 30 or 40 of them. Um, that Stephen talks with his family about the Brendan situation. I haven't listened to all of them, but I know that Christy has. Um, and uh, Christy, do you have a comment? I just want to, as Millbilly, as I have the same feeling that you do, that Brendan must have saw something or heard something. And I understand law enforcement fed him everything, but I still have to wonder that because Kayla, he told something to Kayla before the cops ever went to him. Yes. Right. And that's what bothers me. That's what still bothers me about Brendan. He something was said before the cops fed him information. 
I and I don't know what they were trying to get Kayla to remember. I know that phone call that you and I keep listening to. Right? Is that what you're talking? The one where yeah. she You gotta remember. You gotta remember. Yeah. I don't I don't know, but it, it's so my, my, I was, I just, my theory on Brendan having seen or heard something, depending on what your theory is on who's involved, I, I still question what did he tell Kayla? We need, what to, happened try, in that? We need to try to clean the audio up on that call. We really do. We so really we do. The original form because you can't. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Bad. Yeah. And, and guys, that goes to show us the importance of those phone calls in uh, filling in the blank, so to speak. So we've got, so our listeners, and we've got a, a much better perspective of what actually went down. Okay, so Ken Kratz um, set the stage, right, uh, regarding Brendan. He he made it look as, as bad as it can get. Um, but there were issues. There were issues, as we all know, with his interrogations. He had, I think, altogether about six interrogation sessions and this i quote from ken kratz's book and it is relevant to what we're discussing and i'll quote not only was his story halting it contradicted itself it was hard to separate the truth from half truths and impossible to tell if brendan was still holding back now notice the holding back now this is going to be important guys because none of his interrogators believed that Brendan was disclosing the full truth. Sammy, just hold on a second. I just want to finish this quote. Finally, his flat effect, Brendan's failure to demonstrate any emotion when discussing raping, killing, and burning the corpse of a young woman was unsettling. I didn't know if he was, now listen carefully, I didn't know if he was a psychopath, mentally ill, an accomplished liar, or just dumb as a post. In the end, I was certain of only two things. Brendan was there and he helped. Right, so this is the impression <laughs> that Ken Kratz had of Brendan. Uh, BB, do you have a comment? Oh, my God. I want to scream. Um, yes. Or if he's simply somewhere on the autism spectrum, and that is the way he is. Are you talking about King Kratz? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, him too. Him too. Um, but yes, Brendan. And, and they knew these things about him from his school IEPs before they even questioned him when they went to the school and talked to them. Sure. Correct. Correct. Yes. Because did you see, did you hear um, the massive spectrum of uh, of what he thought about Brendan? He wasn't sure whether he was a oh my God, I was cheating mentally over here. ill or an accomplished liar or just dumb as a post. And you're thinking, yeah. wow, you know, he's, he's mentally disabled. Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Child. Big, dead. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, BB. Uh, Big Jeff, do you have a quick comment? Yeah, Brent, Brendan has special needs. I double dog dare Ken Kratz to go to the Special Olympics and start saying that about Special Olympians. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's what uh, he's doing. It, it's, it's, he's learning disabled. He's got a physical disability. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and uh, it's what it, it, what he said is is shameful. Yes, it is. It is, um, and you know, like a, like I said uh, previously, I could only garnish that by having read Ken Kratz's book. And as much as I hate to say it, it gave me a, a new layer, a new perspective of his persona. The guy's dangerous, absolutely dangerous. Sammy, do you have a, a question? Um, a little bit ago, Christy and Mel Billy were discussing phone call, and people are asking, which call is that? Hang on, I'll go get it. I know what it is. Give me a minute. Okay. Uh, Millbilly, you don't know the call offhand, what number it was? I think it's 712. I know Seven. by date. Okay. <laughs> by date. Okay. Give me two seconds. Okay. 
Seven thirty. Seven hundred and thirty. Right. Yep, it's from March 24th at 1700 hours. Right. And okay. it's a phone call. Um, Stephen is on the phone with Dolores and Earl and Kayla are there. And Kayla's in the background oh. talking about the investigators coming to talk to her. Right. Right. So that's Excellent. the phone call. 730. 730. Okay. Thank you very much, Christy. That's super. All right. So we've set the stage. Right. We've set the stage. Remember, there is no forensic evidence tying Brendan Dassey to uh, Teresa Horbach or to any crime, the trailer, the garage, and the um, Toyota RAV4. There's nothing. The whole thing is confession-based. And it really started, if we have a look at slide 177, it really started with the um, interview that uh, Detective Anthony O'Neill did with Brendan Dassey um, at Crivets. And the impression that O'Neill had was that he thought that Brendan was hiding something. Now, I don't know, I mean, echoing what Christy said, what Mill Billy said, whether um, Brendan had actually heard something um, from a brother or from someone else, that's the impression that Anthony O'Neill had that he was hiding something, that there was something more. But the interesting thing is this. When Brendan was interviewed by Anthony O'Neill, he was asked, look, did you see Teresa? Did you see the uh, Toyota RAV4? Did you see um, uh, Stephen? No. His initial story, uh, Brendan's initial story, was a very simple one. He got off the bus with his brother and uh, Blaine, and they both walked down um, the gravel road from uh, the end of Avery Road where the bus driver drops them off at 3.45 p.m., around 3.45 p.m. They walked home and they went into their home, uh, and I think Blaine uh, was went on the phone, had a phone conversation, and Brendan went to his room and started playing PlayStation, PlayStation games. And that was it. It was an unremarkable story. Um, and there was nothing to it. However, what happened was um, Anthony O'Neill was called out of the patrol car, the squad car. And lo and behold, um, Skolinski spoke with Anthony O'Neill. And what Skolinski told him was that on the Saturday, I think it was the Saturday, um, a bus driver went up to a checkpoint and said, look, um, I, was at the, um, I was at the Avery Salvage Yard, dropped off the boys, and I saw a female photographer photographing a vehicle, right? And uh, then things drastically changed. Mill Billy. It was Sunday. The Sunday. Okay, the Sunday. Uh, so the bus driver went up to a checkpoint and told um, one of the officers there about the fact that she had dropped off the boys, but more importantly, that she saw a photographer, a female photographer, taking pictures, I think she said, of a van. Well, as soon as Anthony O'Neill came back in, his whole demeanor changed. He started grilling Brendan and said, well, you know, we've got a bus driver here, your bus driver, who uh, said that um, she saw a female photographer taking a picture of a van and that all the kids on the bus uh, saw it, right? Of course, that's not true. He just made that up. Mill Billy. Well, it's like the game Telephone. One person says this and then another person says another thing. By the time it gets to uh, O'Neill, it's probably changed. Uh, correct. She Chinese. might have said, I seen her taking pictures of a vehicle. She might not have said it, the van. By the time yes. we got to O'Neill, it changed to that. Correct. And and the reason why I would want to change to a van is because Teresa Hallbach went to the Avery Salvage Yard to photograph a van. But there's no way that the bus driver could see that take place <laughs> no. from where they dropped the boys off. Uh, correct, correct, correct. Uh, and um, 
I, uh, I did a presentation on this and it was just shocking when you realize that what had happened was, and in court this was shown, the bus driver got the days mixed up. Yes, she did see Teresa Hallbach uh, photographing uh, vehicles, but they were towards the front of the property, right? Right where the bus stop was. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob's van was actually close to uh, Stephen Avery's trailer, uh, Millbilly. And the vehicles she was taking pictures of were still there. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so the bizarre thing is, and the disappointing thing, was that uh, Ken Kratz knew this. Because Ken Kratz knew the exact days that Teresa Horbach had gone out to the property to take photographs. So he knew that uh, Teresa Horbach had photographed certain vehicles and these vehicles were at the front near the bus stop. So Ken Kratz immediately knew that the bus driver was in error. However, they didn't check. They didn't check the veracity of the bus driver's comment. That is, if you stand at the bus stop, you can't see Bob, Bob's van. You can't see a photographer taking pictures at that distance. And there were researchers who actually went out there with a camera, with a camera to show you can't see anything at that distance, right? And uh, if you have a look at my presentation, I show an overhead map. Um, showing the distance between the, the, the bus stop and where the van was. There's no way the bus driver could see that. Kelly, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was going to say the one thing it does show is it shows that Brennan can be easily swayed into changing hey. his narrative. Well, <laughs> That's the one thing it showed. Yes. Well, Come yeah. on now. He was yeah. very first statement was I saw nothing. Then they came to yeah. him and said, No, 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 no. Everyone saw the bus. Oh, okay, then yeah, I did. And the whole time it was impossible. So it goes Fantastic. to show them. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. We've got this kid here that yeah. we can he's simple. We can work with this. That's what O'Neill was saying. There's something yes. more to it. He wanted yes. that opportunity to be able to go back and drill it and have an excuse. Oh yes. Well, if you listen, if you listen you, to him interviewing Stephen, he's well known of the area. He grew up in Manitowoc. He knows the yes. officers. He sent in there for a reason. Yes. 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 Well, uh, uh, to echo what Kelly said, Brendan then thought, oh, okay. Uh, if the my bus driver saw um, Teresa Horbach taking pictures, and everyone else on the bus um, saw um, Teresa or you know a female photographer taking pictures, then he was thinking, um, "Well, how come I didn't?" And you can see he said, "Well, um, I wasn't looking," and Detective O'Neill was basically saying, "Oh, come on now." You know, you either saw her or you didn't. Unfortunately for Brendan, he then changed his story and said, oh, that's right. Me and Blaine were walking down and we saw her vehicle come up the road, the gravel road, and we stood on the side and we saw her leave um, the salvage yard. Now, remember, this is at 3.45, right? Allegedly, she arrived at around about 2.30. So this is more than an hour that Teresa was down with the van, allegedly with Stephen Avery, taking pictures. That clearly could not be the case. But tragically, uh, Brendan changed his story again, <laughs> right? He went from saying, oh, yeah, we saw her leave to... Oh, that's right. I saw her taking photographs of the van um, near my mum's house, and I saw Stephen Avery there as well. So he changed the story twice in one interrogation, in one interview session. 
that made O'Neill think that Brendan was hiding something. So he was, as Kelly alluded to, Brendan trusted in authority. Well, if the if my bus driver saw it, that means that I had to have seen it. Why didn't I see it? And he went along. He actually went along with um, the fact that, yes, he did see Teresa Horbach, and that had a devastating effect. Uh, guys, any questions on that? Any responses on that? Uh, Big Jeff. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to recall whether or not the bus driver gave the testimony of seeing Theresa Hallback at the trial. Uh, he said, she did. You know, she, yeah, say. she did. She did. And, uh, yeah. The, and, the, and yeah, sorry, Big Jeff. And uh, I'm also trying to recall whether or not um, uh, during Stephen's trial and perhaps uh, Brendan's lawyer as well wanted to take a trip to show the jury the distance from the uh, point of the bus stop to the point where Barbara's car was being um, photographed. And whether yes. or not Ken Kratz, who is uh, just who's going to do his job in favor of justice for all, bought that or whether he said, yeah, let's take the jury down so they could really see for themselves. No, oh. no they, did. they did none of that. Unbelievable. Yeah, they did none of that, Big Jeff. Uh, Kate, do you have a comment? Uh, I also think that Brendan doesn't like he thinks that lying is a bad thing so not only does he not want to lie but he also doesn't want to be seen as a liar so when they're saying basically no that's not right you're lying you're lying you're lying so that yes you know any answer he gives he has to say what they want him to say otherwise they're going to think he's a liar yes and, and uh, i think they played into that yes and kate when you think about it what was the danger of agreeing with the bus driver Brendan thought, oh, yeah, she just drove past, no problems at all. I mean, he said nothing nefarious, nothing nasty, uh, nothing about hearing screams or, you know, nothing. He thought, ah, oh, he thought it was trivial. But, of course, yeah. it, now, it now placed him there. It placed him at a potential crime scene. He never really understood the significance of it. Sammy, do you have a, a comment? We have someone in here named Jazz Naz One, and they're asking: Was any of Brandon's school teachers called up for his trial? Uh, no, I don't. I don't believe they were. I uh, could be wrong. I don't think any of his teachers were. I'm sure uh, his teachers gave reports. Um, I, I forgot the actual the technical term for his uh, reports you know, how he was going in school. But I don't believe any teacher provided, like, a character e reference well, for him. I, I know they did talk to his uh, mean IEP? driving teacher. Right. Yes. Yes. But, uh, Milbili, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think any of his teachers appeared in the trial no. themselves. No. 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 There were definitely actually... questions by officers, mm -hmm. but... Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Um, Sammy, does that uh, answer the question? I believe so. Thank you very much. Yep. No, no, no. Thank you. So uh, none of his teachers uh, were uh, called up to trial to give a character reference. Uh, and, uh, you know, Ken Kratz basically told everyone um, <laughs> what he thought of Brendan. Uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? Oh, it was just, um, I'm pretty sure that the cops did see the paperwork for the IEP and talked to somebody. Right. Like yeah. a counselor yeah. there about that the first time when they went to the school. Correct. And talked to them. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Um, that's correct. Um, so, you know, we, we now have, look, this really is an issue here because the bus driver um, got the day wrong and she admitted it. Uh, so Dean Strang said to her, uh, could it have been another day? Yes, it could have been. Could it have been another week? Yes, it could have been. So she was completely unsure when she had actually seen the female photographer. And it's pretty obvious that she saw the female photographer at the front where she drops off the boys, not where Barb, uh, Barb Yonder's van was at that time, which was right down the gravel road, right? A simple let's go out to the Avery salvage yard with a video camera 
would have shown that that wasn't indeed the case. But here's the issue. Dean Strang and Jerome Buting thought, ah, we have a bus driver who said he saw, she saw, Teresa Horbuck alive at 3.45, which completely throws off the timeline. Because if Teresa Horbuck was um, chained up, uh, raped, murdered, well, it had to be after she had visited the salvage yard at around about 2 or 2.30. So now we have a bus driver saying, oh, no, 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 I saw the photographer at 3.45. Now, so that's why the defence thought, ah, there goes, there goes the whole case. They can't be true because Teresa Horbuck was clearly alive and we have Brendan Dassey who saw, her, who saw her drive out. But you could tell because Fassbender and Wiegert, if you have a look at my presentation, said to Brendan, hey, wait a minute, the time's not adding up, bud. And that's exactly what Fassbender said to him, that he knew that um, this could not be. The timeline didn't make any sense at all. Uh, guys, do we have any comments? We're good. Sammy, we're all good? Fantastic. So quite clearly, what Brendan thought was rather a trivial comment, um, Anthony O'Neill took it that Brendan was hiding something, concealing something, and that had devastating consequences. Okay, now guys, if we can move now to slide 178. Oh boy. Now, this is really, really the crux of where everything went wrong. And that is um, Brendan's alleged conversation with Kayla. Now, Kayla, uh, Milbilly, can you tell us a little bit about Kayla? Whose daughter is she? Earl's daughter. Earl, Earl's daughter. Earl. All right. Okay. Earl, yeah, Stephen Avery's brother. So uh, this would have been Stephen's niece, right? And uh, allegedly, uh, Millbilly. Yes, that's his niece. Yes. So allegedly at some birthday party, my understanding is, uh, Brendan was um, apparently sitting by himself. Uh, and um, uh, apparently he was a little bit down and he had lost a bit of, uh, apparently a lot of weight and was crying and Kayla went up to him and, uh, you know, said what was wrong, you know, what's going on. And Brendan allegedly confessed that, um, you know, he had seen certain things in a fire, right? And uh, Kayla was interviewed by, I think it was both, Fassbender and Wiegert. And you can see here, Wiegert makes the comment. Now, remember, this is after talking with Kayla. Uh, uh, Wiegert says, we needed to talk to Brendan again. So remember, uh, Fassbender and Wiegert, first of all, tried to convince Jody to try and turn against uh, Stephen. And Jody basically said, you know, bugger off. I'm not interested. And they went down the chain. And lo and behold, who do we have next? We have both Kayla and Brendan. And Kayla at the time, I think, was 14. And Brendan at the time was 16. So two young kids, obviously making some big statements. But clearly, Wigger and Fassmender took them on point and they believed what they said and they wanted further information. Mill Billy, do you have a comment? I'll just uh, respond to a comment. Uh, someone said that uh, she, that Manitowoc entered her information in the system an hour and a half after she was reported missing. That's not true. She reported right. missing at 2.37 and her info was entered into the computer at 6.34 p.m. by at Dennis. 6.34. Okay. Dennis Jacobs. Okay, that's so correct. Almost three hours. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mill Billy. Uh, Christy, do you have a comment? 
After listening to the phone calls, I often wonder if Candy had anything to do with Kayla's discovery and conversation with Brendan. Candy was really gunning for Steven. She was uh, yes. out into every media outlet she could. Candy and Candy being Kayla's mother, I yes. feel like Candy definitely could have been a manipulator and part of that going down, honestly. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, and Candy was um, Earl's wife. Yes? Correct. Uh, yes. Stephen's sister in law, Earl's wife, and Kayla's mother. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Kate, do you have. Kate, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, the police or, or the prosecution, I'm not sure, were showing Earl footage and audio recordings of Stephen and family, you know, anything they might have said about Earl as well to try and turn him against Stephen. Yes. So I'm not sure if that happened before or after yeah. Kayla's statement, but yeah. that might and, also uh, add into it. Yeah, and Christy, thank you, Kate. Christy, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Um, Stephen was showing a lot of concern about uh, what uh, Candy and Earl were saying in the media. Is that correct? Absolutely, because he said that Candy has always had it out for him. Him and Candy have never liked each other. And I also wanted to mention that Candy also happens to be Marie's mother. And Marie is the one who accuses Stephen of raping her in Barbara's right. basement. That is yeah. also, you know, I mean, same... Same players, same mother. And Candy, from what I understand, Candy's not exactly a great person. Dolores right. talks about Candy's family um, and just their criminal records. So, yeah. you know, Stephen absolutely thinks Candy's behind the Marie thing. So I think Candy could be behind this too. Yes, yes. Because uh, my understanding was that Kayla um, talked to a counselor at her school and so um, I'm not sure whether the counselor contacted law enforcement or not, but it then obviously progressed because um, I think it was Fassbender and Weigert went to go and speak with Kayla uh, at Earl's house. So they obviously took uh, an extra step and said, right, we need to speak to Brendan again. Now, keep in mind that O'Neill would have probably told Fassbender and Weigert about the fact that Brendan had seen Teresa, had seen Stephen, and had seen the uh, Toyota RAV4. So it puts him right at the potential crime scene. So clearly, Brendan now became a person of interest. All right. So guys, if we have a look at slide 179. Now, this is truly remarkable. Now, as you can see, the approach that uh, Fassbender and Weger, especially Fassbender, took was, hey, you know, don't see me as a law enforcement officer. See me more like a father, a father figure. We're there to look after your interest. You know, uh, don't see me as an investigator. And he even said, he even said to Brendan, I want to come over there and give you a hug because I know you're hurting, right? And this is while they're uh, interrogating him. Um, and they're asking him a whole series of leading questions all the time, right? Now, remember, the investigators know, allegedly, that bones were found in Stephen Avery's burn pit. And they're questioning Brendan. Did you see anything? What did you see? Because, of course, Brendan had mentioned about a fire being called over for a fire to collect items to burn in the burn pit. And Wicket just comes out and says, look, what's going on here? And he even describes the burn pit. And the burn pit itself was small. He said, Wicket, I quote, the burn pit, Brendan, was no bigger than this table, right? But, so in other words, it was only a few feet by a few feet. But if you have a look at the official crime scene photos, the burn pit appears huge. And why? Does it, can anyone tell us? Uh, Big Jeff, can you tell us why the burn pit went from such a small size to being so massive? Well, in order to burn a body, you need to throw quite a bit of heat. Yes, 
correct. Um, Maz, do you have a comment? Yeah, because they'd obviously dug some more out by searching for the bone. Yes, yes, correct. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is they uh, brought in heavy equipment, machinery, and end loader and started digging it out. So you end up with a small, what originally was a relatively small burn pit, and it now turned into this monstrous burn pit. And as Big Jeff alluded to, hey, you need to make the impression that it was so big, you can place a body in there, you can add so much fuel to it, because in order to cremate a body to those bones, you need a lot of fuel. Um, to keep the fires burning and burning hot. But we get asked an important question. Both Fassbender and Weger kept on saying, did you see anything, Brendan? Did you see anything, Brendan? And then out of the blue, in a low voice, Brendan says, toes. Panel, is seeing toes good or bad? BB, what do you think? Well, in this case, for Brendan, it's definitely not good. <laughs> no, but isn't it funny how a child, the way the mind of a child thinks, you thought, oh, I just saw some toast. Yeah, like, that's okay. Yeah, that's nothing, he thought, he thought, yeah. nothing to see. Somebody yet. can live without them. Yeah, exactly right. It, 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 it's, it's, um, it's such an innocuous statement. I, I just saw some toast, right? But of course, toes are connected to feet. Feet yeah. are connected to legs, and you know the rest. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Well, we just uh, we just can't forget that uh, before he uttered that he seen the toes, um, that uh, it, um, he the, the, the investigator said to him, "Well, you must have seen something in the fire." Correct. And, and they're naming various body parts, and it just so happens to come up with uh, you know an appendage to one of the body parts that they mentioned. Correct, correct. So it's almost like the investigators gave him an option, a series of options. Pick one of them. So he he gave. It's not the, almost like that. It's exactly like that. Yes, yes. So he gave the the most innocuous answer. Toes, Maz. Do you have a, a uh, comment? I think if I remember rightly, the investigator said, "Come on, Brendan. Did you see head? Did you see arm? Correct. Did you see correct. Brendan? And of course." Obviously, after all of that, and he's thinking, well, if they said all that, maybe I'll say toes. Correct. Correct. For a child, um, you know, he, he's probably thinking, I just saw toes. <laughs> As in, I couldn't identify who, who was in there. I just saw some toes. Right. So therefore, he chose an innocuous comment. Then Fassbender said to him, well, Brendan, you know that toes are connected to feet legs, torso. So in other words, if, even if you said you saw toes, then that's mm. proof positive to the investigators. Okay, so you did put Teresa Hallbuck in the fire, right? So I just want to read um, a comment, right? This is by, this, this is a, a quote from Ken Kratz's book. And it is important because by Brendan saying, toes it was a turning point and if you have a look at slide uh, 180 you can see that his report his statement which he signed on the 27th of uh, February he goes I seen the toes now Ken Kratz in his book says the following and when he admitted seeing toes and other body parts in the fire on October the 31st, Brendan Dassey morphed from being just another wayward young person on the property to perhaps the most critical witness against Stephen Avery. There you go. So they entrapped him. They led him down the path. As soon as he said that he saw a body part, boom. So now all of a sudden, Brendan Dassey became a very important person as a witness against Stephen. Uh, panel, do we have any comments? Uh, Obi-Wan, 
Yeah, I just <clears throat> like how he says in his comment how he changed the narrative there to where it said he's seen toes, but then they said that he's seen other body parts, you know what I mean? How he like yes. kind of nonchalantly just added that little bit in there to yes. make it seem well, worse remember, than what it actually was. Like, how, yes. He carried her to the fire, remember? Yes, 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 yes. So now all of a sudden, uh, Brendan Dassey is a critical witness. Obi Wan, any more comments? Oh no, no. Okay, all right. A uh, uh, big, big Jeff. I, I I love the use of the word wayward, right? <laughs> wayward, uh, it's 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 in like the home for wayward wayward children. Uh, we have in the states. Uh, it's for you know lost, exploited children. But what is yes. it exactly? Does he mean by wayward? And what type of well, insult is he trying to make to the whole family? Well, actually. If you read the book, um, he actually makes a lot of disparaging comments um, about the whole Avery Dassey families. Um, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, he's not shy about uh, ripping them a new one. Um, and so now Brendan Dassey is a very important witness. Okay. Now, after this interview, Remember, uh, they talk to Ken Kratz. They have to get it down on video. They do the uh, March 1st interview. Um, it's all down on video. Now, let me read a quote from Ken Kratz's book. This is important because it fills in an important step uh, in our podcast. Now, I warn viewers, uh, our listeners, sorry, that there are there is swear words, but this is a direct quote. Later that afternoon, my cell phone rang. This is Ken Kratz talking about what happened next. We need to see you, we get said. Urgency in his voice. How did it go? You ain't gonna fucking believe it. Dassey confessed to raping Teresa while Stephen watched, and they killed her together. Wigget was right. I didn't fucking believe it. How did you get him to tell you all this stuff? I asked. <laughs> we just kept telling him. It's okay, Brendan. We already know what happened. And the kid kept telling us more and more and more. Um, I don't know whether I we should stop the podcast here right now because I feel sick, absolutely sick to the core. So <laughs> you can see that the um, the prosecutor, Big Jeff, come on, tell us what you're thinking. I'm going to try and ratchet it down a little bit, um, but there's just no thought in Uyghur's mind that what, what he might have been telling him was just telling him anything to yes. get Uyghur out of his face. Like what we don't have, and we, you know, we talk a lot about the, the March 1st interview. One of the comments yes. in the March 1st interview is, well, this isn't going to be, we're not going to get in your face like we did in the last. Year. Shockingly, yes. we don't have the tape from that previous interview that he's talking about, which I, which I think was at Fox Hills, but I could, I could, I could be wrong about that. Yes. Um, so the kid's got PT. He's done. He's non-confrontational as it is. Um, and uh, he probably has PTSD from that last uh, interview. He's yes. going to tell them anything to keep the, to keep them from getting back in his face, and Uyghur just does not recognize yeah. that. Um, uh, yes, C correct, correct. But it's almost like um, the impression I get was uh, they were excited, like little boys. Uh, oh, look what we've discovered! Look what we found! Look what Brendan Dassey has said, and uh, and when you then go back and and uh, Mill Billy will back me up on this. When you see the full interview, you can see exactly how they coerced him and how they fed Brendan all the key critical points. Uh, and it's like, well, you know, uh, Mill Billy. Well, I don't know how many people out there know that the video on YouTube, part one, part two, part three, 
part one is edited. It's missing like 36 minutes of footage. Right. Right. But I put part one back together and put the missing footage back in. Yeah, superb. And guys, please have a look at that uh, on Mill Billy's channel. But, uh, you know, the amazing thing is this. Remember, we always go back to Kayla. And, and Ken Kratz made two comments in his book. And I'll read them out because they're relevant. Brendan's 14-year-old cousin, Kayla, the daughter of Earl and Candy Avery, told investigators in late February of 2006 that she was worried about Brendan, right? She also asked the counsellor, this is, uh, this is um, Ken, um, Kayla, she also asked the counsellor whether blood could come up through concrete. Now, <laughs> That's a that's a pretty scary comment coming from a 14-year-old child. Milbilly, do you have any further information where that blood through concrete came from? Your guess is as good as mine because they didn't okay. find mine, so. Yes, but what made Kayla talk about blood coming through concrete? Big Jeff. I don't know. Well, I, I I don't know either. But um, you know, if you you can you can pretty much surmise that there was probably a lot of talk going across the dinner table back and forth. Yes. Um, about uh, just speculation after speculation. I just believe what tw what was she? Uh, what did you say? She was thirteen, fourteen years old at the time. Yes. Yes. Um, I ha I've had fourteen-year-old girls myself. My girls are older than that, and yes, that's something that would scare them. You know, if they if they thought to if they thought to believe that, some somebody might have said something like that to deliberately scare them, to freak them out, just because they were being jerks. Yeah, my daughter yes. is fourteen. <laughs> Your yeah, my, daughter is fourteen. My youngest too. They could absolutely. Right. So could it just be wild imagination? It could, could be it wild be? imagination, or it could be that, or it could be that one of the older boys just felt like being well, schmucked that day. Yeah. I, I, I yes. found out that Remaker's, no, I can't remember which officer. One of the officer's wife is a counselor. Right. And, and if they live in the area, they work in the area. Right. The okay. counselor that reported this was doing a internship right so, Her herman's herman's right wife i think Melbourne. yeah i think you're correct i just find that awfully strange i haven't found a real connection yet but yes it jumped out at me when i found that out right but um guys it's clear it's clear what's happened here the investigate so kayla is talking to her counselor the counsellors must pass on the information that then re-interview Kayla and then they head on to Brendan because, and then when you figure the interview that he had with O'Neill and O'Neill would have said, look, this kid is hiding something. And it all came to a head because then he admitted that he had seen toes. Now, this had the following effect. We get said, Oh, we took the whole family and we took them up to Fox Hills, right? Uh, which is very interesting because they asked him, well, why did you do it? And he said, well, we're law enforcement officers and we were worried for his safety, right? And he stated in court, our job is to protect people and he knew more. So what he was basically doing was he was trying to shield the family. He was trying to shield the uh, Brendan from the other family members because they thought, okay, if Brendan goes home, uh, they may try and harm him. They may try and kill him. They may try and do anything because he admitted to seeing toes in a fire. Christy, do you have a comment? If they let Brendan go home, they knew the family was never going to let him talk to them again. That's why Correct. Mm -hmm, they knew. Because as soon as Stephen found out that the cops were talking to him, he was 
no, they would have stopped it. They would have never gotten their confession and they didn't have enough yet to arrest yes. him. They didn't, the, the story that he was telling wasn't good enough. They had to keep him Correct. until his story was good enough because if he got free of law enforcement yes. and he was on Avery Salvage Yard, the family was going to encircle him and not let him talk to law enforcement anymore. Stephen was going to demand it because Stephen knew what he was doing at that point. Yes. That's yes. that's why they, they direct him to say things so they can go find evidence that will corroborate his Yes. Statements. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that, and that explains, guys, why they went to uh, Bob's house to pick up his jeans, right? Because his jeans apparently contained a splash of uh, um, uh, the bleach. Because they were saying, uh, oh, what, what did you do, Brendan? Oh, we cleaned up a red spot, uh, which apparently was blood. And they used Teresa Horbuck's clothes uh, to clean up the blood. Uh, and uh, they had to get bleach and gasoline and other things to clean the garage floor. And they went inside Barb's house, uh, Brendan gave him permission to get the jeans because what they were looking for, guys, and that's exactly what Mill Billy alluded to, they needed corroborating evidence because at the moment it's just a story. Uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? I, I do. I, I was wondering, you know, uh, if, in, our, in last Thursday's podcast uh, or the continuation, Christy went through the timeline for us of, uh, of the... Um, the brief having to do with the, uh, the sorry the um, the prop the property bond. I was just wondering if she, if she yes. could just you know just t tell us the important date there. Uh, when when was Judge uh, Willis going to rule on the property bond? Paperwork was filed by Dean Strang on Friday, February twenty fourth, to request yes. the bond hearing. On Monday, February twenty seventh, um, Judge Willis signed the paperwork accepting. Dean Strang as lawyer, or that might have happened. That might have happened on Friday. On on Monday morning, Judge Willis um, accepted the property bond paperwork and was about to set a hearing date. I don't know what that hearing date ended up being, um, or what it was going to be. But Debbie Clem right. tells Stephen later on in a phone call that night that she heard on the radio that the judge had issued a prop a hearing date for next week. Um, that's how important it was. Ken Kratz needed Stephen to stay in, in jail. He needed in Stephen jail. not free. And yeah. I really believe that they, <laughs> we said this that day in the podcast, when do you, when do you attack the alibi last? Why was the alibi something that wasn't destroyed until four months after the fact? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Kate, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say with regards to the collecting the jeans, I don't think they should have been allowed to go in with the permission of a 16-year-old who wasn't even the homeowner. I believe that too. <laughs> yes, yes. But um, <laughs> believe it or not, it was actually Bob. Yeah, it was actually Bob who told the law enforcement um, officers about the genes. So that's how they found out about it. Because if you look at the interrogation, they say, oh, um, we were told about uh, genes having um, bleach marks on them, Brendan. A uh, BB. Yeah, remember we went back and we looked that up. That's ago. correct. Oh, and it sure. was Barb who originally first brought those genes <laughs> yes. up. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Yes. Yeah. It, it, was, it was Brendan's own mother that told the law enforcement officers about the genes. So that gave them a lead in to the investigators to get physical evidence uh, against Brendan. Uh, Obi-Wan, do you have a comment? Yeah, although that Barb did give them the knowledge that the, gene, the genes existed, she didn't give them permission to go into her home. And here you have a 16-year-old child whose yes. property does not belong to him. It belongs to... Uh, it's actually Barb's home, but she didn't give them permission. Correct. I don't see no. how whatever they went in there to take and they left to me signifies like an illegal search and seizure. Yeah, you know I mean, because uh, yes. he didn't give yes. them permission to go in. Well, he gave them permission to go in, but the homeowner didn't give permission to go in and take whatever they wanted Excellent out of it. Excellent so point. So to me, I feel like they can't use that evidence against him. Yes. Because it was illegally confiscated. Okay. 
of tank. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, well, let's think about it, guys. And we could talk about this because we covered it in a podcast. You've got Kayla talking about uh, blood uh, seeping through concrete. We've got Brendan mentioning, oh, look, we cleaned a red spot on the ground. Uh, that's obviously where they had shot uh, Teresa Horbach. Um, and they used, apparently, allegedly used her own clothing to clean up the uh, blood and then throw the clothing on the fire. Um, so, therefore, they were trying to look for the presence of blood on the jeans, right? And, of course, they found none. There was no presence of any blood on his jeans, right? And furthermore, you know, and Big Jeff will uh, back me up on this, the investigators came in on March the 2nd, I believe it was, and they ripped up the concrete in the garage. They used a jackhammer, they concreted, uh, they uh, jacked up a lot of the concrete, and they then checked for the presence of blood. Of course, they found none. And the concrete, of course, was porous. What does Ken Kratz say in his book? Oh, oh, the reason why they didn't find any blood is because they put the, uh, Teresa's body on a tarp. <laughs> so he's got an answer for everything. Why um, no one the found any forensic tarp. evidence? Big Jeff. The bulletproof tarp. A bulletproof tarp, correct. Because uh, according to Brendan, they'd shot uh, Teresa 10 or 11 times. Uh, and uh, there was no sign of blood, no sign of Teresa's blood anywhere within the garage. So uh, Ken Kratz said, look, uh, it's because they used a tarp. So he was trying to account for why they couldn't find any forensic evidence. But what they couldn't say, well, the reason why he didn't find any blood is because no one got shot in the garage. Right, that's the obvious thing, but they have to keep on. Ken Kratz had to keep on speculating all the time why they consistently failed to find forensic evidence. All right, and that's important. So they shipped the family to Fox Hills. Now, oh, Chris, Doctor, can I interrupt you for one second? Of course. Mildred, there's there's a question about. Uh, Raleigh Johnson winning the lawsuit. Millbilly, what did he get? Four hundred and fifty dollars, yeah. and uh, that's well, he, the price you pay for renting to a criminal. He didn't get shit. I thought he got four hundred and fifty dollars. Um, that's what I mean. He didn't really get. Oh nothing. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Compared to what the damage they did, um, he was given four hundred and fifty dollars and a sorry, not sorry. That's the price you pay for renting to a criminal. Is basically. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Well, no, no, thank you, Christy. Well, basically, the investigators destroyed his property. That's uh, Roland's property, Johnson's property. The trailer, they tore to pieces. The garage, they tore to pieces. And, and what? They gave him $450. Big Jeff. Correct. That might have patched the floor. <laughs> that wouldn't even have patched the floor. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, well, they, Jeff, didn't, have they also didn't yet have the most important piece of evidence yet, did they, Doctor? Uh, no, no, correct. And we'll talk about that in a second. So here's what Ken Kratz said about Fox Hills. Now, please listen carefully, uh, um, guys. This is very important. Now, this is from Ken Kratz's book. To shield Barb and her children from intimidation. Officers invited the Yonder family to stay at a local resort, Fox Hills, many miles away from the Avery compound in Michigan. It seems clear that Ma and Pa Avery cared about Stephen and Stephen alone. Now note the following. They would sacrifice their grandkids in a heartbeat, I thought, rather than give up their freshly exonerated son to the cops, Barbara Greek stay at Fox Hills for the night. Now, can you can you imagine Ken Kratz feeling sorry for Brendan and Barb? Guys, do we have any comments? Big Jeff. He's so full of shit, it's coming out of his ears. L listen to those phone calls. <laughs> listen yes. to those phone calls and, and, and tell me that Barb doesn't care about everybody else. 
I mean, excuse yeah. me, yeah, Dolores, I mean, Scarry. Yes, yeah. And, 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 and the goal for a prosecutor to say that they would, that the grandparents would sacrifice Brendan just so that but, Stephen gets released. But uh, yet he if, only had one night worth of sympathy for them. Yeah. Because it was yeah, just one just, night at Fox House. Yeah, yeah that really is, works well. Yeah, to yeah, shield them. Yeah. Yes, which is horrendous when you think about it. Christy, do you have a comment? He felt so sorry for him that he prosecuted him for a murder. He absolutely positively did not commit a murder that Ken Kratz had zero forensic evidence Brendan was involved in. Collateral, collateral damage. Correct. Correct. Now, so concerned was um, uh, Ken Kratz for uh, Bob and, and her son that Ken Kratz further says, now listen to this, Bob was definitely a loose cannon and nobody could assure me that she wasn't more interested in saving her brother than her own son. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I am speechless. I am speechless, guys. Christy, do you have a comment? His narcissist, though, his, his narcissism just, yeah, it kind of leaves me speechless more often it, than not. <laughs> but it, got, it goes beyond the pale. Because mm -hmm. what does Bob say to the camera when uh, Brendan makes the confession? Hey, Stephen, I hate you, rot in hell, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Ken Kratz is saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're worried because um, Bob will support her brother and uh, leave her son out to dry. Whereas the opposite was true. When Bob first heard the um, interrogation, or read the notes or whatever, he thought that Brent, uh, that Stephen was a killer, her own brother. Guys, do we have any comments? So quite clearly, uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I mean, li listen, listen to the calls. It's just so absolutely ludicrous and stupid to, uh, to, to to think that Barb had more love for Stephen than she had for any of her sons. Yes, uh, it's uh, stupid. I mean, it, it, it's stupid. Yes, correct, correct. But here is a prosecutor, a senior prosecutor, writing all this down in a book, right? And uh, it's completely flabbergasting. All right. So he obviously put the family up. They obviously put up the family in Fox Hill. Uh, now, the interesting thing is this. Uh, Blaine uh, was interviewed. Now, I'm not sure <coughs> which residence um, they took Blaine at, but Skolinski um interrogated Blaine and Barb was with him, right? Barb was with him. This is about seeing the bus driver and Teresa taking photographs. And Blade said, absolutely said, no way. Me and my brother got off the bus. We walked down to our home and that was it. Nothing remarkable happened. And this, guys, was one day before Brendan got interrogated by O'Neill. So here we have the situation whereby Blaine is with his mum and Blaine remains steadfast that no, there was no photographer, no Teresa Horbach, no Raph or nothing. And what better person for an alibi for Brendan than his own brother? And yet Ken Kratz did not question Blaine about that in the trial. Why not, guys? He could have cleared this all up by asking Blaine two questions. What did you and your brother do the moment you got off the bus? Tell me, why wasn't he questioned about this? That wasn't going to fit. That wasn't going to fit Ken Kratz's narrative. Correct. Blaine's answer wasn't going to be what Ken Kratz wanted. Correct. That's why. That's why Blaine didn't testify, and I believe Brian didn't testify either. Brian has, Brian has but, a statement. Why were not? Why was <laughs> anybody but, that could have? Yes. 
correct, but isn't this mind blowing when they're meant to be getting to the truth? And here we have Blaine walking down with Brendan, who could have been the perfect alibi for Brendan, and yet they failed to ask him the question. Big Jeff, yes. do you have a comment? Yes. It must not have been part of his job. Yeah, <laughs> it must not have been in his job description. This case was never a pursuit for the truth. Never. Not even for no. a millisecond. It's just it was like about. The, it's just it like was when about they reopen it. They reopened the case in 2017, and they got all these conflicting statements. And what do they do? They believe what Bobby says. Correct. Correct. Who Correct. demonstrated who demonstrably lied in that testimony because he said the computer wasn't in his room, despite the fact we have video and pictures. Video actually. evidence. Correct. Correct. Yeah. There's a video that actually shows the computer in his room. Um, look, there's no doubt. It really is absolutely crazy uh, whereby you've got two brothers uh, get off the bus at the same time and walk down to their property at the same time. And yet you don't ask the other brother, Blaine, well, what did you see? What did you do? And they believe Brendan's uh, fantasy story, but they don't ask Blaine, right? I mean, Brendan, think about it. Brendan could have walked out of that courtroom, an innocent man, if they just asked Blaine, well, did you see the photographer? Did you see this? Did you see this? What did you do with your brother? And Brendan, frustratingly, told the truth the very first time he spoke to O'Neill. He wrote it down. He said, I got off the bus, I walked down the road, and I went home. I played computer games. And that's exactly what Blaine said when he was interviewed by Skorlinski. And apparently Skorlinski and another uh, agent were yelling and screaming at, at Blaine. Can you believe that? And they got up and left because it contradicted with the eventual story, what Brendan said. Big Jeff. Yeah, uh, one thing of note is that uh, Barb Yonda accompanied Blaine during that uh, interview. And well, yes. Blaine was what, only one year younger than Brent? Uh, or, you, or pretty two. close to the same age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. I, and I so just, I just still can't believe Barb did not go in there with with Blaine. Uh, she says they kept her out, and that's that's believable. Um, but yes, uh, but just criminal that he was under non represented, not uh, just under represented, non represented. Correct. Correct. Yeah, he was basically left to his own vices. And guys, if we have a look at slide 181, we can see that that terrible, horrible uh, interview that was done. On March the 1st, 2006, where both Fassbender and Uyghur interrogate Brendan. Uh, and they actually played the uh, testimony to the, to the jury and the judge. However, and I'll read it out, the jury does not see the last one hour and 38 minutes of the recording, which includes Brendan telling his mother the investigators got to his head. So the jury didn't see that part. Um, but frustratingly, the, uh, when, uh, the, when the state asked the defense whether that was true representation, the defense agreed, yep, no problems, we can stop it there. Maz, do you have a comment? Yeah, that bottom picture with Wigget with his hand on Brendan's leg, it just makes my stomach crawl because you can just, he was all like, I'm the fatherly figure. I can help yes. you, Dory. I'm on your side. And why wasn't, yeah, I can understand the jury seeing the whole pic, the whole of the tape, but why didn't they show them the last eight minutes or whatever, or that bit yes. with Barb coming in and hearing Brendan say, they got to my head. Yes. Why wasn't that bit at least shown? Well, you see, that would have then put doubt into the jury's minds, thinking, uh-oh, this kid is already recanting, already saying, uh-oh, that's not really what I meant. They got to my head. They were, you know, essentially saying a coercion. Uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? 
Well, also in that picture where he puts his hand on his leg, it's not just putting his hand on his leg. There's an audible sound of yeah. him, you know, slapping his hand down on his leg. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and by the way, BB, this is all part of the read technique. Yes. That's and, he followed. It's an aggressive <laughs> movement. Yeah. He correct. So both Fassbender and Wiget followed the read technique to the to the letter. So as you can see, when things were hotting up, when the uh, um, when when these um, when Brendan needed reassuring, they got closer towards him and touched him. Obi Wan, do you have a comment? Yeah, the gesture with the putting the hand on the lap or knee. It like signifies is that like we're here for you or uh we're gonna get through this we'll we'll we'll, we'll come up and bat for you or something you know that it's correct to make the other person feel secure correct and an actual thank you obi-wan in actual fact brendan said look the reason why i said all the things that i did was because they reassured me that no matter what i said i'm not going to get into trouble Right. And so he was comforted in a way that he could just say whatever. And he said, look, he even said, am I going to make it to my class in uh, uh, in the afternoon? And they said, I don't think so. So he was more concerned about handing in a project than realizing what he was telling the investigators. Maz, do you have a comment? Yeah, that's just what I was going to say, what you've just said, actually, about Brendan was more concerned about getting back to school to hand in a project. And what they've done to yes. Brendan short of child abuse, in my opinion. Yes. But uh, <laughs> remember, uh, we're talking ahead now uh, in which the whole interrogation thing was previewed, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, both Fassbender and Wiget have got no remorse because they just followed the rule book. So they don't feel responsible at all. And in actual fact, um, one of the investigators for the uh, defense said to Wigert, goes, do you know how many times you told Brendan he was a liar? And Wigert just puts his hands in the air, shakes his head, and he goes, no. They told Brendan that he was a liar 75 times during that one interrogation session. So if you, you're being continuously told you're lying, what Brendan did was he simply said what they wanted to hear because when he told them the truth, they said to him, no, Brendan, you are lying. And not only that, don't forget, guys, O'Kelly did the same thing to him, right? And O'Kelly was meant to be on his team, same with Kaczynski. So Brendan kept on being told, you're a liar, you're a liar. Big Jeff. I mean, I wish O'Kelly were here so I could punch him in the face. Um, is but, that but, the only no, thing you want to do? No, 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 no yeah, well, yes, it is. <laughs> um, but but O'Kelly was even worse because O'Kelly came right out and said, "If that's your story, Brendan, I can't help." I can't you. help you. You know what I mean? That that's even worse almost than coer that, that. It's outright. So you got to. This is the way the story got to be told. It's worse than coercion. And Big Jeff, we must remember, O'Kelly is on his side. <laughs> Obi Wan. <laughs> Correct. He's actually given the story that we know. He he's given the the true story, the first three times that he was he was he gave his statements, then he gave the truth to Kelly, and then he took the stand, and told the truth. He he mm -hmm. said the truth up on the stand. Correct. And we don't know what story he's given when he was at fox hills but i can guarantee you it was the truth correct but, but manipulated you know they manipulated yes. him they had to have manipulated him there they yes. even said that they went back and they viewed the videotapes well, within the last couple days which the last yes. couple of days would have been the fox hills incident oh yeah so whatever tapes that they reviewed would have been 
the Fox Hills incident. So right. it would have had to have been recorded unless yes. they're standing there lying about it now. Yes. And uh, tell me, do we have any documentation of what transpired at Fox Hills? No. Well, well yeah, we no, have uh, transcripts. No. They no, say. Not really. But we have them stating that they have tapes and they're going over their notes. So what happened to those? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just just to preempt everyone, I wonder what was showing on TV at the time. <laughs> hint, <laughs> yeah. hint, yeah. hint, 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 well, hint. Uh, that's four times given the truth. Why wasn't yes. the truth accepted those times? Correct. Actually, five. Correct. Five because times. It, yes, because Obi Wan, we know it didn't fit the narrative. It didn't the fit the narrative. Was, the truth wasn't going to convict Stephen Avery. Correct. Correct. Amaz, do you have a comment? Yeah, over here in the UK, the police cannot lie to you, whereas in the States, they can. And they that can. Is, that is one big law that I think needs changing. If that was changed, you wouldn't get this. No. There would be no, none of this confession whatsoever if they said the truth to Brendan all the time. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mads. Yeah, I want to address that. If they can lie, how can you how can you be sure that they're telling the truth when they're putting together evidence against somebody to convict them? If they can lie to their suspect and their family and friends when they're questioning them, how do you know that they're telling the truth? In their case, correct, correct. And, and that's that, exactly what Cratch is going to use. Correct. You mean you mean to get out? Yeah, to get out. Of, He's just going to say, get... "I was just following the evidence that the investigators gave me." Yes, yes. Um, Kate, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say after the O'Neill, is it? I think it was just after that that he then got interrogated again by Fast Benjamin Weger without a lawyer. So they got him to falsely confess again. And then they yes. basically said to him, you know, you need to phone your mum now and tell her what you just told us. Otherwise oh, we're going to call yes. her and tell her that, yes. you know, you're a liar. So then they yep. used a phone call against him as well. Yes. Yeah. Co ab absolutely correct. Uh, so the, the investigators actually set him up, right? And then they played back his own phone call to his mother against him. And that's what did him in. A big Jeff, do you have a comment? Yeah, about that phone call, to me it is very uh, important and critical that when Barb asks him outright, so you so you did so you did some of that to that did do some of that stuff to that girl, he says some of it. Some he's of it. He's not explaining explicit about what he does right because he's no, been ordered correct. he's been ordered to confess i mean he's essentially you know being told by people that you know he, you, there's only one way out of what, what's happening to you we can't help you unless you do this call barb yes uh he he confesses to her he says okay uh, I, I did it yeah what, what'd you do well i did something he doesn't want to be explicit because he doesn't want to lie yes. to his mother by you know correct he, if, if he had uh, i stabbed her he could have said that to his mother if he had done it. Yes, but he doesn't say. He says, he says no. some of it, right? That's, well, that's that's a liar's. That that that's that's a way to do what he's told without having to really admit to anything to him. Yes, yeah, he was non non explicit. Uh, Obi Wan, do you have a comment? I th I think when he said that he was doing that, he did some of it. I think the things that he was actually telling the truth about, like either coming home from school, him and blame walking or him playing video games, like those type of things that he was doing. Correct. That's, that's the sum of it. You know what I mean? That's not what, yeah. You know, I mean, I don't, it's just manipulative how they, they played that, that hand, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and some of it also might be like clean the garage floor. Or yeah. Like helping correct. Stephen clean the yeah. garage. Yes. Correct. 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 And it's don't you find it rather remarkable that um, uh, King Kratz, if you read his book, he is livid with Netflix. He goes, oh, the way they edited it, the way they took things out of context, it's all this, it's all that. And yet he did exactly the same thing with the phone call of Brendan to his mum. He never explained, they never explained the context of what Brendan meant with these statements, and yet 
And yet, Ken Kratz complained about Netflix doing editing on statements. Uh, BB, do you have a comment? Yes, Kratz does it. Um, when he makes those little videos about Brendan, too, he does these heavily <laughs> edited, highly uh, suspect uh, videos. And when Correct. we dig into this, we see that Netflix maybe didn't show us everything, but not only Correct. on the police side of it, they also did not show us everything of the their innocent side of it either. Correct. We have found uh, tons of things we dug into and found. Yes, yes, th yes. That and Netflix the, never touched. Yeah, the, the reality I have a is... Here. Oh, sorry, Sammy. Aussie is, Aussie is asking, does anyone know whether Brendan has ever had a formal diagnosis? If not, I, I believe experts may be able to help in regards to these interviews. There's that Do under the head, under the hood report or something. Yeah. 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 Uh, there, there actually was a psychologist that uh, was um, questioned on the stand. Um and the, the uh, defense, base, sorry, the state basically uh, ignored him because he 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 uh, came up with the statements, you know that that Brendan he wrote a report and he basically said that uh, if Brendan was uh, placed under pressure, uh, he would be easily uh, swayed uh, in his um, answers and opinions. Um, so if you put him under a psychological pressure, pressure of an interview, pressure of an interrogation, he will be easily swayed. They ignored it. They ignored it. There were certain things that he could say uh, that he couldn't say in court. So they basically manipulated the they basically manipulated the um, the psychologist, the child psychologist, which is. You know, rather remarkable. But yeah, um, if you uh, tell Ozzy Ozzy, yeah, there was a psychologist that actually had written a report about Brenton. Yep, I thought so. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Yeah, Laura Nyrider references uh, the um, uh, now, uh, diagnoses of her experts uh, during the on bank. Uh, uh, her her on bank arguments uh, that he's incapable yes. of uh, the, the way that he cognitively processes things and whatnot. Correct. Like, um, if you ever wanted um, a person who was really suspect to the way they uh, with the re technique, Brendan is your model citizen. He's the person that you don't use the re technique on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but now they've actually used this as a seminal case of what not to do to someone like Brendan. Correct? Right. Correct. And even and even at the time of Brendan, they were it was written in part of that Avery boot bill, the juvenile interrogation one, was that they weren't to use the read technique. Correct. They were to photograph them. It's why his is the first one that was videotaped under the new law. So he shouldn't have been video. He should have been videotaped, but there shouldn't have been the read technique going on in it because that that was part of the bill, the law, too. Correct. And correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't one of the people responsible for teaching officers the read technique beauting? Yep. Uh, beauting. <laughs> Computing himself. Yeah. Uh, Maz, do you have a comment? Maz, do yeah. you have a comment? No, I was just going to say that it was Joey Busing who had something to do with the read technique being brought in as well. Yeah. Who was that? Joey Buting. Yeah, Buting. Correct. So, how ironical that Paul Brendan was suspect um, and fell to pieces using the read technique. Um, and he, I remember his um, his attorney, Fremgen, basically said that, look, there is, Mark Fremgen says, look, there is no forensic evidence at all. And everything that um, Brendan said, he and I quote, I think they are garbage. And out of the whole trial, that's probably the most, the most important statement of the whole lot. 
everything that Brendan said. There was no corroboration, and it truly was all garbage. And yet, this poor kid, with no forensic evidence against him, is sitting in prison. It's just a terrible thing. So, guys, if we have a look at slide 182, um, I am conscious of the time, guys. Uh, we'll put a wrap to it uh, soon because we can continue this. We can go on for another couple of hours. Mark Wiegert was, um, he was questioned during the trial. And uh, the uh, investigator, he did this all-encompassing uh, question. And he, he asked Mark Wiegert, essentially, was there anything connecting Brendan Dassey to the, to the death of Teresa Hallbach? Yes or no? And he paraded all the evidence that was on a table. And Mark Wigger goes, that's correct. As in, there was no evidence. His final comment was, he had five days to clean up. Maz, do you have a comment? Yeah. He had five days to plant evidence, more like. <laughs> yes. But to me, to me, this showed the frustration of the case. Um, when they couldn't find any evidence, the state had to come up with excuses. They used the tarp. Um, they, they cleaned up. They used bleach. Uh, they disposed of everything. And yet, the crazy thing is this. How could Brendan and Stephen clean up the micro? evidence against them blood spray blood spatter hair fiber cleaned up the mattress clean this clean that and yet we are to believe that Stephen Avery left a Toyota the victim's vehicle with his own blood on the Avery salvage yard and kept the key in his own room and not only that, he leaves 11 shells on the ground. Kate, do you have a, a comment? I just wanted to add, he also left his own blood splats all over the trailer. How did he know which blood splats were his and which were his to clean up? Correct. Correct. Uh, Maz, do you have a comment? Well, yeah, I certainly like him to come and clean up my house, that's for sure. So that did it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, guys, let, let's face it. Right, it's the pot calling the kettle black. Right, on the one hand, like, and um, there are other um, uh, uh, researchers who've called Brent, uh, Brendan and Stephen the savant and the idiot, which is true, you know. And Mark Wicker did, but the thing which really almost I punched my TV was the smirk that Wicker gave when he said. They had five days to clean up. And you could see his head movement, shoulder movement. It was a form of, there, take that. Right? He, in other words, he, he was actually stirring up the investigator that, they were, that these two, um, Brendan and Stephen, had the remarkable ability to forensically scrub um, the trailer, the garage. Yet, as, uh, as Maz, I think, or Kate said, yet leave droplets of blood in the laundry and other locations. That was fine. Big Jeff. Lincoln Remaker were there on the 4th, so I'm not sure where they're getting the five days from. Yes. Yes. So, you know, the whole thing is very, it's insane. Oh, now, if you go from Milk the 4th to the day they arrested him, it would be five days. Right. Right, because uh, the investigators, well, I know that it was either Lenk or Colburn that went inside Stephen's trailer to give it a cursory look. Um, Millbilly, do you know the exact date when uh, somebody went in his trailer? 11 4. The 4th. Lincoln yeah. Remaker. Yes. yes. The morning of the 4th, yeah. around 10 30. Right. And so, nothing... so clearly, you know, one yeah. day since she's been called in. Yeah, that's why you hear Remaker saying they want us to go back and search again because he's already been there. Well, that's according yes. to the KSA report. 
according to Stephen, that they were there in his trailer searching around like four or four thirty. Right. Okay. It was in the but, evening, is what the, what he said. Sorry. Right. Okay. Okay. But clearly, that somebody had gone in there, had a quick look, couldn't find anything, didn't note anything nefarious. Didn't smell right. anything either. There wasn't the strong no. smell of cleaning products, right? I mean, it, it, <laughs> they Correct. didn't report how clean it smelled. Correct. And look, guys, let's face it. Uh, is it nefarious to have a bottle of bleach? If so, I'm guilty. I got a bottle uh, of me too. Room. I'm, I'm guilty <laughs> as well. Yeah. Uh, which is so crazy. So owning a bottle of bleach all of a sudden became nefarious and oh yeah of course they use it to hide forensic evidence which is outrageous so guys i really would like to finish it here because um we've done well over two hours uh and we've now entering an, a part of the podcast um which will take at least an hour to go through uh, but uh, i, I want to leave it with a final comment of michael horbach so Michael Horbach, Michael Horbach is obviously uh, Teresa's brother, and he was the spokesperson. And uh, every time they had uh, uh, inter you know interrogation sessions, when when the witnesses were questioned, they they talked to Mike. And uh, obviously, this is during Brendan's trial, and Mike just came out with it. He goes, "We love the police," with a big smile on his face. Now remember. There's a trial about his sister who was butchered. Butchered, not murdered, butchered. And he's got a big grin on his face saying, we love the police. So, panel, we better leave it there. Um, are there any final comments that you would like to say about today's podcast? Uh, Christy. I think it's important for people to listen to the calls, um, read the summaries. Yes. Pick which calls you want to listen to. I think it's important to read Ken Kratz's book. Um, come over to Foul Play. I will tell you how to read it for free so that he doesn't get any money. Um, <laughs> join us on Discord. We talk about this stuff quite frequently. Um, our theories, the different information. It's really a, a collaborative of a lot of great researchers. I'm so grateful to be part of this team. I love it. So just come join us. This is definitely a topic that some of us get quite heated up about. I don't think I've ever yes. heard Jeff. I don't think I've ever heard big Jeff curse so much in one podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and that's before you, and that's before you started the podcast. No kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, BB, BB, do you have any uh, final comments? Yeah, no, I can only repeat what Christy said. Yeah. Okay. It's, this is just, it's so much bullshit on top of bullshit that yes, it's yes. never ending. No, it, it is never ending. Um, but hopefully, um, you know, people will come to their senses and see and see for what it really is. Um, Big Jeff, do you have any final comment? I, I do. The, the uh, one extra piece of reading material I'd throw on top of Christie's is Judge Wood's uh, decision uh, at, at at the uh, the the one before the on bank review, which was the uh, the the first the states the state's first appeal uh, to the three judge panel, and she absolutely gets it, and she completely eviscerates Weigert and Fassbender's inter interview. So yes. lest anybody think that we're you know a bunch of wacko truthers. Uh, there is a uh, an appellate judge who 100% agrees with everything we said and actually t tabularized the interview and did some of the things that yes. you were doing, so it counted it up. Uh, mandatory reading, if you think the, uh, that uh, you know, we're, we're just uh, alone voices of, of wackoism. There's lots of people who believe yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, Kate, uh, do you have any final comments? I was just going to say about Kratz's book, it just further shows me that there's no real evidence against either of them. It's just filled with his rambling, ridiculous stories. Correct. Yes, correct. I agree with you. It's Ken Kratz that's actually making up all the fantasy stories. Uh, Maz, do you have any final comments? Yeah, if you're going to listen to any calls, listen, listen to the May ones, because the May ones are really what tells the story 
and what brings like a great finale to hopefully we're going to get some more seats to carry on the story. But if you're going to listen to any calls at all, then please listen to the May ones. Listen yes. to them all. They tell the whole <laughs> picture. You get the better understanding with that. They went after Marie, didn't work. Went after Jody, didn't work. Then they went after Brendan. It yeah. worked. Yeah, it did. It did. Um, Mill Billy, do you have any final comments about the uh, podcast? Mm, nope. Okay. Obi-Wan? Oh, yeah, I do. I was actually working on something, but um, it kind of... I know Brendan's like a really touchy subject with a lot of people. Yes. And uh, I want people to understand that there, there's many people that have differences in opinions concerning Brendan. Uh, we, we still support him. That doesn't make any of us less of a supporter as it pertains to him. I know this young man, a uh, child at the time, was coerced, manipulated by very two seasoned, cunning, coercive oh, officers yeah. uh, who abused the color of law. Uh, the controversial read technique that's been shown to uh, be used to produce false confessions for not only yes. children uh, who are easily influential but intelligent adults into lying, falsely confessing to crimes they didn't commit. Correct. Uh, these officers also violated protected rights that are protected under the United States Constitution. Uh, I get it. Yes. We get it. We understand what happened here. Uh, although we may see uh, things that are uh, some some users take offense to what we say about Brendan and uh, the yeah. issue that's going around with Fox Hills. But uh, understand it's nothing malicious. We're only looking out for Brendan's best interest and uh, what we can do to help him and him help himself. And only he knows what took place at Fox Hills, and only yes. he himself can help. Yeah, uh, I understand. I understand, everyone. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, uh, Maz, Maz, thank you, everyone. Maz, do you have a comment? Yeah, just a quick one. Kelly's put um, any idea when more calls are coming in. Um, as far as I'm aware from what Christy said earlier, they have been foyered. We are just waiting for them to eventually turn up and then get converted and then they'll be put on foul play no doubt yes yes um yes yes for sure uh and i i think we we are really blessed that we have um an excellent uh panel and an excellent group of researchers we work in a very good cooperative manner and uh, also we have excellent questions that come from our listeners and that really helps. And uh, it's fortuitous in a way that even though we're going over MAM, um, we're now integrating uh, passages from Ken's book, other books, and also the phone calls. So we get a much better idea of what's happening. Uh, so, guys, I'd like to thank uh, our panel for uh, today. Uh, I thought the podcast went really well. Thank our listeners. Remember, if you like what we do, please subscribe. Hit the like button. Uh, and if you've got any further questions, please write them down. And we'll go over them and try to answer them as quickly as we can. And i like to finish with another quote from Ken's book. And uh, get ready for this. Because Ken actually did a video on this and he took it down. This is Ken. I quote. This may surprise you, but there is one opinion I share with even the most rabid factions of the Making a Murderer audience, and that is that Brendan ended up sort of sacrificial lamb. We may disagree on who is responsible for this, but make no mistake, Brendan is a victim in his own way, and I have a lot of sympathy for him. I've said that for years. Well, I think uh, uh, after that, guys, I need to see a therapist. I think we all probably need to see a therapist. And uh, thank you, guys. Uh, and we'll catch you all next week when we continue our podcast. Next week is going to be very interesting. This is when we look at the very controversial 
statement that uh, Brendan made in regards to Kiss the Girls. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, now, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Join us on Discord. Have a good nice weekend.